Blog Talk Radio. Greetings. This is uh, Gus T. Renegade, the cow, context of white supremacy. Uh, speaking with Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., just trying to get some of his views. Always uh, helpful to uh, hear his view on racism, white supremacy. Um, Mr. Fuller, uh, I had heard you in a previous lecture. You said that early on, when you were still learning about racism, white supremacy, and you're still learning now, that uh, you thought that what non-white people, black people should do is show white people that they had some sense, uh, show up to work on time, uh, show white people that, hey, black people are smart, we're intelligent, and that will stop white people from practicing racism, white supremacy. And you said that you, you later concluded that that was not accurate. Um, can you can you talk a little bit about when you felt that way and what caused you to change your view on that particular issue? Well, that's what I was hearing, but I didn't see any evidence of that in any substantial way. Uh, the white supremacists like for their victims to know a whole lot if it serves a system of white supremacy. And in other circumstances, it depends on the circumstance. In other circumstances, they like for them to be ignorant and stupid and silly. It depends on what they want done. It's all The system of white supremacy is like any other business or uh, criminal activity. I mean, if you're running a criminal activity and the system of racism is a criminal activity. It's the crime of crimes. Uh, if you're running whatever it is you're running, and it runs on business principles, you just use business principles, which are universal, profits and losses. So you teach slaves how to be great artisans. If you want them to build something, that's great. They have to know how to do it. So you'll teach them that. If you want great architecture or something like that done by your slaves, you would teach them architecture. You you will stay right with them and be very meticulous in what you what it it is you're teaching them because you want this wonderful building built in your honor and you want it to be done correctly. So the people who are going to do the heavy lifting or even the brain work on it they have to have the ability to do this. So the white supremacists have no problems teaching their subjects, their slaves, how to do the things that they want done. But the slaves shouldn't get so distracted from that as they learn how to accomplish things that they forget why they were taught in the first place. This is why black people should never brag about anything that they know because uh, during the system of white supremacy what you know was taught to you by the people who have you under oppression so what are you bragging about black people usually brag to each other about what they know what they have learned what they have been allowed to learn or encouraged or enticed to learn Mm under the system of white supremacy. And then uh, these are things that have an overall constructive value, but it's under the system of white supremacy, under the tutelage of the white supremacists. Now, other things, for the greater masses of black people, they prefer to keep them ignorant simply because you can't have too many black people who are smart about things under the system of racism. It's the basic format that was used on plantations. You teach one or two black people how to get things done, how to birth babies, as they say in Gone gone with the Wind, because you will need them in a crisis. You teach them how to drive the coach, uh, how to fix the wagon wheel, things like that, kind of advanced skills and whatnot, how to be what you call blacksmiths, uh, get that done. You know, how to do some iron work, some wood work. But the greater masses, the state out in the cotton fields, and heaven forbid, don't let them learn anything 
at a sophisticated level that will put you in danger of being a plantation master. That hasn't changed. That's the basic format throughout the world right now. That's why you still have a whole lot of ignorant people, even after all these days of so-called independence in what we call the motherland, Africa. You have millions and millions and millions of people who are in a primitive state, primitive state of mind. <coughs> don't know how to do much of anything except what they have done for the last thousand years. When you were uh, on the program uh, this over this past weekend, you said that the system of white supremacy has made many of the non-white people in the area of the world known as Africa uh, has made many of them permanent beggars. Um, can, can you explain what you mean when you say that? All non-white people, under, all people under the system of white supremacy are beggars. We have to beg for everything. Please teach me how to do this. Uh, you've got nine areas of activity, economics, education, entertainment, labor, law, politics, religion, sex, and war. What we learn that is of any value in all of those areas is under the tutelage, under the domination of the white supremacists. That's what white supremacy means. And whatever you get, material-wise, is under the domination of the white supremacists. If you're driving a car down a highway, there wouldn't be any car, there wouldn't be any highway if it wasn't for the white supremacists, either directly or indirectly. You don't build a highway without their permission. That's what I mean by begging. You don't build a railroad without their permission. And they will determine where the railroad's going to go, who it's going to serve, because it's got to serve them, or they're not going to help you build it. They're not going to build it for you. They're not going to teach you how to build it and how to operate it. It's to serve and strengthen what is already in place, and that is the system of white supremacy. That is worldwide. That's what the term white supremacy means. People have to get out of the notion that white supremacy means six white men in a station wagon flying rebel flags and yelling obscenities out of the window, driving through a black neighborhood. And they call that white supremacy. That's just a, that's not even a blip on the radar. That's nothing at all. It's an entire business world system, firmly entrenched everywhere, every village, every city, every school. Black people are still begging. Since you used the word begging, yes, that's the key word. Begging for a decent school. This is 2010, and that's all over the world. Please teach us, teach us, teach us, teach us something that makes sense. Teach us something that will make us, uh, you know, uh, uh, able to do something that makes sense without you holding us by the hand every five minutes. Please come and teach us. We know nothing. We have no sense at all about how to do anything worthwhile. Everything that we do is destructive. We've got a lot of sense about that because you have taught us that, how to be destructive. Anything of any constructive value, we hardly know anything. Everything decays around us. We can't even stand ourselves so much decay. That's what the system produces. It's designed to produce that. So you would say the system of white supremacy, the result of that is that all individuals who are classified as not white, uh, it would be accurate to say they are beggars, that they have to beg racist man and racist woman for whatever they are allowed to have in all nine 
all nine areas of people. In activity. all nine areas of activity. Teach us economics. Teach us how to use time and energy in a way that makes sense, in a way that will, you know, we can see some constructive result. Because we don't know anything about that. We brag about having known it back 10,000 years ago. And that's pitiful to see anybody doing that. What's, what is pitiful about that, sir? It's pitiful because it reaches a limit real fast because you don't see any results of the bragging. You just walk around raggedy and bragging about what you used to be. It's like a person who is an alcoholic bragging about having been a corporate executive and just going around begging and bragging. Well, I used to be this. I used to be that. My great-grandfather was so-and-so. Respect me for what my grandfather was. And the person says, get out of my face. I'm not respecting you for anything because I don't have to. And you're in my way. Move. And stop following me around, talking about what your great-grandfather did. I don't care about you or your great-grandfather because I don't have to. So in a very short order, it gets to be silly. It comes under the head of being silly. It's, it's stupidity. No, it's best just to leave that alone. Just forget that. Because whatever your great-grandfather did, it didn't work out too well for you. It fell by the wayside. That's the thing to examine. Where did the train run off the track? Hmm. Purpose for studying what we call black history, and there will be a month coming up next month. The whole purpose should be to find where the train ran off the track. Where were the mistakes made? Because a whole bunch of them were made. You don't study history to glorify anything. You study history to find out where the mistakes were made so they don't get made again. Mm. At what point did we become stupid? And why? If we were of anything at all, which I say is completely unnecessary when you start talking about the production of justice. Based on what? Logic. You don't have to have anyone coming before you having done anything. Because there's a first time for everything. There's a first time for the product of justice because it's never been done. Not in recorded history anyway. You never had a situation on this planet where no one was being mistreated and the person that needed help the most got it. Hadn't happened in recorded history. Uh, the records, if there's some recorded history saying so, those records have been lost and can't be proven, can't be verified. But that's the product that should be produced. It is such a thing of things happening for the first time. Black people are taught by the white supremacists that before you can do anything today, you have to go and re do some research and find out that it has been done before. That is not true. The universe at one time was created for the first time. Everything had a first time. Now, who taught whoever did it for the first time how to do it when it was done for the first time? This is the mode of thinking that we should be in. We shouldn't fall into that trap of thinking that I am completely immobilized until I find that somebody has done something that I'm fixing to do before, that has been done before, when it doesn't take but just a little bit of logic to figure, wait a minute, who taught the first person to do it when it was done for the first time? They didn't have a teacher. They taught themselves. 
And that's a whole breath of fresh air, a new perspective altogether. But the races will say, oh, you can't do anything. You can't even walk down the street. You can't move. You can't think. You're completely immobilized unless you find someone somewhere 10,000 years ago who crossed the street before you. And once you learn that, then you can cross the street. And when we fall into that type of trap, they laugh again and say, how stupid can these people be? They bought that. I just said it. And there's nothing logical about it at all. But they bought it immediately. You can't do anything. You're traumatized until you find that your grandfather did it before you. Now you can do it because your grandfather did it 8 million years ago. But you can't do it until you find that out. Even though you see other people doing it, you can't do it until you find out that he did it. It makes no sense at all. Mm. Yeah, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., uh, context of white supremacy. Um, would you say then it would be accurate to say that President Obama uh, is a beggar? Do you think that's an accurate statement? Well, uh, I don't want to flirt with the code violation of name calling. Mm. So um, I, I like to describe what people do rather yes, than, you know, put a label on people and say that they are beggars as such as individuals. Okay. But yeah. under the system of white supremacy, all non-white people have to beg the white supremacists mm. in every area of activity. Bill, you know, if we want a church, we have to get permission. Can I build a church? Mm. And then I have to get permission to you know, to teach whatever I'm going to teach in that church. Mm-hmm. And if the church, church is burned down, you know, like the, you know, a few years ago they were saying someone is burning the black churches down, I have to go to the white supremacists and say, please build me another church. Give me permission to build a one, one. And they usually accommodate because they say, well, as long as you are teaching something in that church that's not going to hurt my business, I'll help you rebuild it. In fact, I will chase down the people who burned it down and tell them not to do that anymore and force them, if necessary, not to do that anymore because what you are doing in that church is not harming my business at all. As long as people are killing each other around the church and sometimes even coming into the church and robbing people, I approve of that. There was no harm to me at all. You're not harming my business, which is mistreating people. As long as you're singing about what's going to happen when you die, and keep it that way, don't do like Martin Luther King, start messing with my business out of your church. I'm not going to tolerate that. But as long as you stay in there and talk about how beautiful things will be somewhere off of this planet. I have no problem with whatever your religion is. That's the white supremacist's voice talking. But if you give me any trouble at all, you're not going to even have a parking lot outside your church for your parishioners to come and park to go to your church. I'll rezone you. (laughs) <laughs> and I don't care what God you've got you go move that place your God is in heaven I'm your God here and don't you forget it um, I guess I, I, was, I wanted to make sure um, when I did uh, hear the previous lecture where you spoke about, uh, and you touched on it earlier, um, that you were hearing people say that if non-white people could show white people that they were smart, that they were interested in in learning 
and uh, that they, you know, third, to not be mistreated. You were hearing that this was a way to replace white supremacy with justice, and you said that you didn't see any evidence that that was true. Um, do you is that something that you still hear people saying that you know that's what that's what even non-white people that's what we need to do we need to stop showing up late to work and stop wearing our shoes untied and things and go to school and learn and then white people will see that we should not be mistreated do you still hear that and do uh, have has have you seen any evidence to change your mind to think that that that's a constructive way to combat racism. No, but that is a constructive way for us to behave because it's a matter of that's what we should be doing if there are no, were no people on the planet except us. Mm-hmm. We should be doing things that make sense. Every every move that a person makes is either constructive or non-constructive. Mm-hmm. Everything that we say, everything that we do. So these are the categories to stay in. It's a very simple codified formula. Mm-hmm. You ask yourself, this thing that I'm fixing to say, is it going to be constructive or non-constructive? Mm-hmm. This thing that I'm fixing to do, is it going to produce a constructive result or a non-constructive result? So if I'm walking down the street and my pants are falling down, I just ask myself that without looking around at anybody. Mm-hmm. You know, nobody's around but me. I'm walking in the woods. So I just ask myself. Is this constructive for my pants to be falling off? Or is this non-constructive? Is this helping me to do anything that makes sense? And then answer the question myself. Not ask somebody else. Nobody out there but me. A black person walking through the woods, 800 miles from any other person, put my pants is down around my ankles and I'm trying to walk. Now what am I doing? And what am I doing it for? I don't I'm not really criticizing the person who has his pants hanging down. I mean halfway, you know, no belt and all like this. Uh I'm just simply saying, what are you doing it for? What kind of result are you expecting from that activity? This is an activity. This is something that's very carefully thought out. Now, why have you thought this out and decided that this is a move you needed to make? I'm going to see to it that my underwear is showing. Okay? This is a project. That I have well thought out. This is what you know. This is this is what I've prepared for ever since I was you know five years old. All of my skill, everything that I went to school for, everything that I heard people say on the street or in an office building or wherever, has led me to think. Now, what I really need to do is unbuckle my belt and let my pants drop below my hips and walk down the street. This is a wonderful project that should produce great results. So you just measure, okay, where are the results? Where are the results? What are you producing? Where is the constructive activity? Well, now, if he can answer by saying, oh, I'm trying out for a hip-hop record. Now, if that's what it is, then what is the record about? And is is it going to produce a constructive result? And you say, well, I made a lot of money, you know. Okay, any other results? Well, I influence some other people to do what I'm doing. Okay, that up to that point, that might be constructive, all right. But then, you know, I can't argue with it. I'm just saying the question is, why are you doing what you're doing? Everybody's doing something. The fellow walking past you with the briefcase and the suit and tie, he's doing something. What are the results of what he's doing? In, in fact, he might be the fellow who is instrumental in manufacturing the pants that you are wearing. Because he owns the factory where the pants are made. Now, that's his result. 
So in a way of speaking, you might say that he's implicated in what you are doing. But then what does he do with the money that he gets from what he's doing when he manufactures the pants? And for what ultimate objective? Because everybody should have an ultimate objective for everything that they do, for every move. That's an important question. I see what you're doing right here for the moment, but what is your ultimate objective? And some fellows, they, you know, they may not have it framed in their mind because they're not that focused, but there's, they might be saying by their behavior, well, my ultimate objective is to be an inmate. Number seven seven twenty five three three four in a lockup because all of their behavior shows that this is exactly where they're going. I mean, if it, you know, you just sit down and quietly talk to them. You know, everything that you are doing, you're walking around. You know, you've got a gun in your waistband. You got another one strapped around your leg. And you're walking through, quote, unquote, the hood. Now, what's your ultimate objective? We know that that's what you're doing right at the moment. Okay. You had breakfast this morning at your aunt's house. Now you're out on the street. You got your two guns, a couple of extra clips, your dark glasses, your tattoos. You got your hair extensions. You got your image now. Okay. All right, now what's next? That's chapter one. What's chapter two? Well, chapter two is, hey, sometime for the months out, I'm going to be in a shootout. Okay. That's chapter two. Okay, chapter three. And four and five. Well, I figure if I keep doing this... uh, by the time I get to chapter 15, I'll be dead. Oh, okay. All right. That's what you want to be? You could have been, you could have done that from day one. Being dead is easy. You know, that's one of the most easiest things in the world for, for the most incompetent of people to do. And one of the next best things, I mean, that's easy, is to get locked up. You know, be in somebody's handcuffs. Now, if you want to really show some skill and really show how smart you are in the hood, be able to say, I've never been shot and I've never been locked up. And I'm 45 years old in the middle of the hood. I've never been shot and I've never been locked up. And I'm right in the middle of a hood where just about every shot are locked up. But I'm 50 years old. I've never been shot, and I've never been locked up. Now, take a look at me and figure out how I pull that off. <laughs> wow. Since um, you talked about how... Uh, if you if your goal is to not be here anymore, um, I was just curious. Um, you I've heard you say that racism, and white supremacy, is war, um, and that if a non-white person, a victim of white supremacy, if they decide that they uh, are unable to deal with the mistreatment, um, they can decide to uh, terminate the life of races uh, and then uh, terminate their own life um, if it is if racism white supremacy is war against non-white people um, why would it be incorrect uh, for the non-white person to say I'm going to uh, I'm engaged in warfare I'm going to try to eliminate as many of the people that I believe are engaged in warfare against me, I'm going to try and eliminate as many of them as possible. Why would that be an incorrect stand for a victim to take? It's not incorrect. That's in the textbook. Okay. And that's for the victim of racism to make that choice. Everything in the text in the counter-racist code 
Everything in the counter-racist concept is supposed to have a counter-racist effect. And in the nine areas of activity, in the economics, you do certain things, you don't do certain things. When it comes to the last area of activity, war, counter-war, that's the recommendation. That is a recommendation of the way you go about doing it. That's as an individual. That's an individual choice like everything in the counter-racist concept is addressed to the individual, the individual person. Okay. You're taking charge yourself. You're not depending on what somebody else does. You're not going on somebody else's wavelength. You're picking and choosing a smorgasbord, a, a buffet, you might say, of things that you do and things that you don't do. There are a lot of things in the counter-racist ideology, the counter-racist concept, that may not fit you as an individual, whoever you, the person is. By you, I mean whoever that person is, that victim. So you just go down the line and pick, up, pick out, just like you're in a cafe, in a buffet, in a smorgasbord situation. Well, you just pick out what fits you. You say, oh, that doesn't fit me, you know. Oh, this thing called Maximum Emergency Compensatory Acts, and that never, would never, never fit me. I'd never do nothing like that. That doesn't fit my circumstances. Because there are certain circumstances that are very specific in, in the war section, the ninth area of activity. I mean, where you take devastating action, counteraction against the racist. It's very specific about the conditions that that's supposed to be done on, done under or done according to in order to qualify for the title of maximum emergency compensatory action. Uh, it has to be a situation where there's, you know, it's, that's why it's called maximum. You can't go any further. There's nothing you can do. You're completely back against the wall, so to speak. Can't get any help from anybody. Nobody will reach out. There's no hope of any help. That's the condition that that's called. That's why it's called maximum, maximum emergency. You know, you see nothing, no way out, not now, not ever. Now, that's the kind of condition that that calls for. As long as there's some hope, as long as there's some prospect, of the situation changing for that individual, for that individual, not for the person down the street, for the individual who is going to enact this very serious act. That's a very serious act because you're talking about death, making death all around for yourself and for others, death making. That's the condition that it calls for. That's what it's about. That's what war is in its in its uh, extreme essence. It's war all the time. I mean, every day is a war. But when you reach the point where people start dying because of other people's actions, deliberate actions, now that's why, you know, you're talking about the ultimate because there's nothing after that. Maximum emergency compensatory action. There's nothing after that. That's the last act. Not going to be any action other than that or after that. And that's a choice for the individual to make. No other individual is supposed to be involved in it. That's one of the prescriptions. It's an individual act. No other individual. There's no point in going and talking to the other individual about it because they don't know anything about it because that's one of the requirements. You don't say nothing to anybody. The action will speak for itself. Nobody's told. Nobody else is implicated. Nobody else is informed. There's nobody else to round up and question because nobody else knew what was going to happen but the individual who did it. Do you think, uh, or the non-white person already is in, um, a situation where people have decided to be in the business of death, uh, the system of white supremacy, 
um, guarantees that large numbers of non-white people are going to be uh, murdered, killed, who should not be. Um, do you think a non-white person, um, do you think it would be incorrect for that non-white person to say, well, I'm going to attempt to uh, terminate as many suspected racists as possible, uh, and since this is warfare uh, that has been uh, launched against me, uh, I'm engaged in counter-war, and I'm not going to self-terminate because this is war, and I don't think that would be constructive. Do you think there's anything incorrect about that way of thinking? Well, if a person decides to do that, that's just a decision that that person makes. But that is not the prescribed procedure under the counter-racist concept, according to the logic that I have written. Mm-hmm. Now, people can, you know, the code is, there's no such thing as the code having, you know, a limit. Mm-hmm. Uh, the code is anything that is counter-racist in effect, which means, you know, People, you know, uh, it's it's totally democratic. Uh, the victims of racism choose how they are going to resist racism themselves, since there is no prescribed way of dealing with racism that's official worldwide. So you know, it's all a part of the code. Whatever that person does, and that's up to them. See, I have just written a book. I mean, with the prescriptions according to me. But the code itself, the concept, is open-ended. I mean, a person can do what they, if a person, you know, who uh, didn't terminate themselves and whatnot, that would not fit the description of what I have written, maximum emergency, because it would prove, for one thing, it wasn't maximum. It wasn't that much of an emergency because the, the person didn't terminate themselves. It means they weren't really ready to go. They are ready to keep, they want to stay here and continue, which means it wasn't a maximum situation. If you want to stay here, that's what that means. Maximum means, hey, you can't take it anymore. You can't even stay here anymore. There's just no way. And that's the ideal situation for terminating someone else. Only when you deliberately, you have decided, based on everything that you have researched, or looking around you, you got no support system at all, and you don't have any prospects of ever having one. Then you're in a maximum mode. That's the most logical process. That's the recommended time for that type of counter-racist activity, where you terminate the existence of other people then you should be ready to terminate yourself. Because if you're not ready to terminate yourself, you might be terminated by someone. So, in effect, you are trying to escape after having terminated others. The message that's being sent, sent, one of the key messages, along with other messages, is that death-making of any kind is supposed to be only done under the worst of circumstances. It shouldn't be a whimsical thing at all. And it definitely shouldn't be a fun thing like it is under the system of white supremacy, where you have huge numbers of black people because of some tribal dispute or joining some gang just for the purpose of running around all over the place killing people for fun and tradition which is totally insane. No. The existence of people is very important, regardless of who those people are. And so when you terminate someone else deliberately, you should be willing to terminate yourself. Hmm. That should be the philosophy worldwide. Okay. What what if a non-white person, victim of white supremacy, says that I feel like as a victim of white supremacy, um, I am experiencing the worst of conditions, being victimized every day and not seeing um, any progress replacing white supremacy with justice. Uh, everyone that I, every non-white person that I am connected to is mistreated 
and I feel it is a valid response uh, to preserve my life to resort to uh, lethal force uh, in combating suspected racists. Uh, and I don't think, uh, I think my life should be preserved. I think this is uh, a logical response to a system that is war against non-white people, terrorism against non-white people. I think this is a logical response to preserve my life, to resort to lethal force, and I should not uh, self-terminate because I should be doing everything possible to preserve my life uh, in a system that is designed to attack my life. What would be, uh, I guess, incorrect or invalid about that, that view? Because it still uh, has the element of it that you ultimately don't want. You're sending that message because most wars are fought in that mode, and it hasn't resolved very much. We're trying to send a different message altogether, that the preservation of a person is sacred and that any person who takes another person away from here willfully and deliberately should be willing to terminate themselves because you're making the point that a person, a breathing organism, is sacred just on that alone. We don't want to make a game anymore. The standard has been war games. It's just another game. It's another game like playing checkers or dominoes or or, or or football. It's in that same category. And this is why you have some people who are sports people who have a gun mentality. Because, and it's natural that they would have it, because that's what games have been made. In the ancient Colosseums, they actually slaughtered people for fun. The Colosseums that we worship in the history books, in ancient Greece and Rome, all about slaughtering, slaughtering animals, slaughtering people, people slaughtering each other, people being slaughtered by animals, watching a lion tear a person apart, and everybody cheering. This is the kind of mentality that that breeds, that is something wonderful about death-making. You can die at any time, and you're going to die sometime anyway. Why glorify that by any measure? Make great movies about it. Take up huge screens showing people and animals and whatnot in combat. Everybody clawing and scratching at each other. Different forms of dying. Blood jumping all over the place. The so-called life force coming out of people. And taking pictures of it and saying, that's wonderful. Boy, that's beautiful. Did you see the way he fell off the cliff? That was funny. Mass sickness over and over again, decade after decade, in what's supposed to be civilized society. we got to get out of the habit of worshiping that type of thing. That's a bunch of nonsense, if ever there was one. I don't care how much money you spend on it. The more expense, the more grandiose it is, the more vulgar it is. You're talking about mass obscenity. That's what that is. Yeah, I, I uh, when we spoke last, I know we mentioned briefly the uh, amount of films, movies, things of that nature, television shows that show uh, violence, and especially violence against non-white people. Um, and, and as you just said, many of the, the films that they spend the most money on, the most time and energy uh, are the most vulgar uh, and, and often the most racist. Um, the Godfather, Gone with the Wind, uh, a lot of these films, uh, Shawshank Redemption, uh, just tons. Well, of well, some of them, mostly more than, uh, well, at least movies like Shawshank Redemption, some of them tell a story the way you learn lessons. Mm-hmm. But the lessons are not very, learned very well. They're put into to a context where the lessons might be mixed. 
uh, or miss rather. Mm-hmm. But then there are some spectacular movies that take up the whole screen. I mean, wrap around, you know, with uh, all kind of stereophonic sound and whatnot. Mm-hmm. And, uh, uh, you know, the sound is pure, the action is spectacular and all like this. But what you have is explosions all over the place. I mean, it's rattling the whole block. Mm-hmm. I mean, uh, you know, images of people slaughtering each other. Right. I mean, by the thousands sometimes. I mean, you know, and that's so wonderful. And everybody's all caught up in it and goggle-eyed. I mean, and, uh, you know, animals and, you know, and different creatures flying through the air and whatnot. I mean, and biting people's heads off. <laughs> and that's supposed to be something that's, you know, hey, this is this is wonderful. This is just beautiful. There ain't nothing more beautiful than this. This is a lovely way to spend people's time and energy. You know, this is something that everybody should look forward to and to make it as real as possible and if and and if you possibly can and survive it, I mean do it every day. This is the way people should conduct themselves on this planet twenty four seven. This mass slaughter, you know, sword in hand and wearing armor and looking grotesque and you know and eyes full of fire and whatnot. And, Laser beams coming out of your eyes, I mean, and blowing people apart. Oh, boy, that's beautiful. Did you see the way he came apart? Came apart? You should glorify putting somebody together after they have had an accident. Not how you can take somebody apart. That's easy. Trying to do something to help somebody who has third-degree burns... That's difficult. Killing somebody is easy. That's one of the easiest things in the world to do, is to kill something. But to try to nurse something to health, that's difficult. That takes some skill. That takes some real skill. You bring somebody into a hospital who's been showered with burning gasoline. you got your work cut out for you. Months and months and months and months and years of work. That's what you have facing you right now. Didn't take but a couple of minutes to douse somebody with gasoline. Less than a second, maybe. Maybe five or six seconds. And they're flaming inferno. You put the fire out. Now you try to nurse that person back. Restore that person back to some type of semblance of health. You got your work cut out for you. But to throw the gasoline on somebody and then throw a match behind it, that's easy. That is easy. You haven't done anything wonderful. You haven't done anything that's difficult. An eight year old can do that. So that's something to brag about. But this is the kind of nonsense that you learn under the system of white supremacy. It's glorified. It needs to stop. Mr. Fuller, can you talk about uh, the the impact of being in a system of white supremacy uh, that dominates uh, the area of entertainment where people around the world uh, can see images uh, of a black male uh, in high heel shoes and dressed up like a female, um, or just non-white people, black people especially, as buffoons and monstrosities. Can you talk about the impact of that worldwide uh, in, in terms of that's what pe- the image that people get to see in the system of white yes, supremacy? Yes, that's what uh, that's what the system of white supremacy does. Yes, I mean that's what they do. You know, anything that's non-constructive. I'll say, I'll repeat again, it's very simple. The formula is very simple. Every move that people make on the planet all day long, wherever they happen to be, even under the strangers of circumstances, in other words, you're aware people don't speak the same language, they don't have the same customs, all you have to do is just look at them and ask and answer the question. And the answer will come pretty swiftly once you raise the question. And that is... I'm looking at this person.
on the road. Now, is this constructive or non-constructive? So you look at what's in the cart. You look at where the person is going. It doesn't take long, you know. And uh, what do they have on the cart? Well, they have some cabbage. Looks like cabbage, you know. Is this cabbage? You might have to ask a person, is it? What is this in this cart? And they make some sign language, and they say it's cabbage. Oh, why you have the cabbage in the cart? Yes. And you're pushing the cart down the road? Yes. Well, where are you going with the cart of cabbage down the road? I'm going to the village three miles from here. Okay, why are you taking the cabbage to the village down the road three miles from here? Because this is where the children are that are going to school down there, and they're going to have to eat, and uh, part of what they're going to eat is the cabbage that I'm going to bring while they are going to school so that they can learn better and not be hungry. Oh, well now, what are they learning? Well, they are learning how to grow cabbage and other things, how to run a farm and grow other things on the farm other than cabbage, and also things like how to make a cart to carry the cabbage. Oh, well, would you say that's constructive? Well, I would, you know, and this is all I'm doing, and I'm not doing anything else other than that. This is what I do all the time. And what is the result? Well, the result is we've got more carts and we've got more cabbage being grown, along with carrots and tomatoes. And the people are pretty healthy. They're pretty well fed. So that's what goes on around here. Yes, this is what goes on around here. This is the kind of things we do. Well, now, so you go and think about that, and you say, now, this, this looks like a pretty constructive, you know, activities. That's what goes on around here. That's what I see people doing, people with carts going to and fro, you know, helping other people to do things, I mean, that will make more carts, to carry more things, to do constructive things. It doesn't seem like that's anything that I can criticize. So now you have learned just from observation. And that's how you learn. You just go somewhere. Go to the middle of a city. Now, if you see the people, you know, you say, well, what is that? Well, that's what you call a tavern. Okay, what goes on in that tavern? Well, people come and go, and you go in there for recreation and entertainment. Oh, doing what? Oh, well, you stand out here for a little while, and you'll learn. So you stand outside, and next thing you know, you hear glass breaking. You hear people cursing and whatnot, and you see two or three people spill out onto the sidewalk, swinging at each other, hitting each other over the head with beer bottles, and then three or four running out, I mean, with gunfire, you know, echoing behind them as they run, dodging behind cars, jumping over the hood of cars, and you see windows being broken by bullets flying. You see someone stagger and fall in the middle of the street. So now you you just got here from the planet Krypton, so you say, oh, now that's what people do in taverns. And you make a note of that. You say, well, I think I can skip that tavern thing. I'm not taking this back to Krypton. I don't think they can use that. <laughs> You know, I don't. I don't think this is anything. You know. You know the people around here bragging about their culture and whatnot. And I don't have to give this a second thought. You know, do we need this on Krypton? I don't think so. Mm. Wow. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me again, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Um, I, I, I've heard you speak about racism, white right, supremacy, and you said that uh, the the ultimate goal of racist uh, white yes go ahead uh, the the ultimate goal of white supremacy is to maintain white supremacy. Um, have, have you seen? Well, I guess if you could share, you know, exactly how you conclude that that's true. That the ultimate objective is to maintain the system of white supremacy. The ultimate objective. 
Yes, sir, is to maintain white supremacy. How have you concluded that that is true for racist men and racist women? Oh, yes. I mean, because the evidence shows this, because this is what happens after everything is done. You still have a continuation of the same system you have in place. So you go by self-evidence. Some things are self-evident. See, now, lots of people have done a lot of things and done a lot of things and done a lot of things and done a lot of things, and people say changes are being made and all like that, but you still have racism in place. Now, where is the fundamental change? When we just got another variation of the same thing. You know, I've, you know, we've got different costumes and all like that, but this is the same play. Same script. Different characters than they had from the last play. Different people, I mean, you know, on names on the marquee. But it's the same play. The play is called White Supremacy. Do we need to just keep modifying the same thing? Or do we need another play altogether? Another presentation? Hmm. Okay, so have you seen anything that would lead you to conclude that the racist man, racist man, racist woman, they they are practicing uh, racism, white supremacy, because they're not informed about non-white people, or they just don't know enough about what non-white people do and don't do. Now, what was the question again? Have you seen any evidence that racist man and racist woman practice white supremacy because they are not informed about non-white people? Oh, no, this is not the reason. (laughs) They practice it out of tradition and habit, and because they don't see any reason to change it. None at all. But it's mostly out of tradition and habit, and because it's convenient and profitable, and it is a part, being tradition and habit, it is the culture. They don't see any other culture that's worth anything. They don't even envision any culture that they would like to replace it with. Some of them do. Some of them say, well, I'd like, you know, why don't we try something different from what we've been doing? But the majority say, oh, no, we like it the way it is. Just keep it just the way it is. It's tried and true. There's a lot of benefits connected with it. Why change something that's working? Some people raise the question, well, couldn't we get something better? Well, maybe. But why bother when we don't have to? When this seems to be satisfying enough. Besides, we're used to it and we like it. It's our comfort zone. People kind of traditionally like to stay in their comfort zone, what they're used to. Even when they hear about something that might be a little bit different. They'll give it lip service. They might look into it a little bit, might even dabble a little bit. But mostly they like to stay in what is traditionally their comfort zone. The white supremacists are in a comfort zone, a long-running show, one of the most successful, if not the most successful, social and material and religious systems ever thought of, the system of white supremacy. So that's a capsule answer. <clears throat> wow. Um, um, excuse me. <clears throat> and again, so you haven't seen any evidence that, you know, they're comfortable. This is what they enjoy doing, practicing racism, white supremacy. Um, they're comfortable uh, in this position. Do you think that Uh, The typical white person, average white person in a system of white supremacy, they are aware of how confused non-white people, victims of white supremacy are? They are aware or confused? Excuse me. I I said uh, 
the average white person in the system of white supremacy, do you think that average white person is aware of how confused most non-white people are in the system of white supremacy? Mm, not necessarily, but they they in a not in a a pointed sense you mm. might use that term because they don't have to be. See, people are only you know usually they do things that may be a little inconvenient uh, or they take an interest in things that uh, might be a problem. That's when people usually notice things. It might be a problem or something that has to do with cause and discomfort. So since it's just like having a machine that runs or, or, or having an electric light, a lamp that's on. Okay, the lamp is on. You don't have to think too much about who maintains lamps or where the electricity is coming from, where the power plant is located. Mm-hmm. All you have to do is just say, well, the lamp is on, and I'm trying to read, and the lamp is on, and I'm getting adequate light. So if someone asks me, where is the power plant located that the electricity comes from that causes the lamp to light? My answer might be, I don't know. Furthermore, I don't care. I got light. So the average white supremacist says, hey, the machine is running. The system of white supremacy is alive and well. So the details, I don't have to pay too much attention to that until I do have to pay attention to it. Like the lamp went out. Mm. Now I might have to contact someone, I mean, and know something about where the power plant is and find out if that's the problem. Because my lamp has gone out. Now that's the way the white supremacists function on a day-to-day level. They pass by millions of their non-white subjects without even noticing them. Because they don't have to. They know that everything is in place. Everything is working well. In fact, they find that when sometimes when they have to notice them, that it's an annoyance more than anything else. <laughs> Here comes the black person, and he's fixing to ask me something. I mean, you know, and I don't want to be bothered. You know, so I'll try to get rid of him as fast as I can. He's in his place, and I'm in mine. Hmm. You think the the white people who, I guess, have more contact with non-white people on a day-to-day basis, um, I guess, do do you feel like they are serving more of a role to to keep that or to make sure that that non-white person is confused uh, about racism, white supremacy? Oh, sure, but they don't have to work hard at it because the non-white person is usually highly trained to be confused. Hmm. He's on automatic anyway. Hmm. Hmm. They can just look at at the way he walks, the way he talks, the things he talks about. They say, you know, he's trained, you know. (laughs) He follows the pattern. He has all the characteristics of a nigger which we have insured are in place. That's what a nigger is, someone who's been highly trained. A nigger, by definition, according to the compensatory code, is a victim of white supremacy. That's the logical definition of the word nigger a person who is in a status of victimization. So when I'm called a nigger, I'm being called correctly when you give it that definition. It's an accurate term, a victim of white supremacy. You can't be a nigger without being a victim of white supremacy. That's the only logical definition. The term itself doesn't have a definition. But if you give it one, that would be the logical definition. Being black does not make you a nigger. You have to be black and a victim of white supremacy. 
that qualifies you for niggerhood. Can you be uh, just a, a non-white person? Non-white person are niggers if they are victims of white supremacy. A victim, a nigger, is a victim of white supremacy. You have to be non-white to be that. Black, non-white, it's all the same thing. The process of niggerization means you become victimized by the white supremacists. That's how you become a nigger. You have to go through the process of niggerization. Replacing white supremacy with justice should correct that niggerization process? It would eliminate niggers. You know, it wouldn't be no such thing as a nigger. It's just like saying that a prisoner is no longer a prisoner. See, just substitute the word prisoner for nigger and nigger for prisoner. You're a prisoner of the system of white supremacy. Once you're no longer a prisoner, you're no longer a nigger within the context of racism. Hmm. Black people who are on some other planet are not niggers. They're not subject to white supremacy because white supremacists don't even know where they are. They're not subject to them. If it's some planet out there, a billion so-called light years away, Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of miles on some other planet that nobody knows nothing about. And the people are non-white, purple people, green people, black people, whatever. They're not niggas. They're not subject to racism. You have to be subject to racism to be a nigger. Racism in the form of white supremacy. That's the purest definition you can get for the word. Otherwise, the word is meaningless. It has no meaning, except within that context. Actually, black people shouldn't get angry when a white person calls them that. Why? That's a very functional definition. Because all they are doing is acknowledging that they are mistreating you. But we have to give it that definition. The reason the word itself has such potency and has lasted so long is because it doesn't have a definition at all. And you can make up any word and then call somebody by that name, the word that you are using, and it will make the person angry if the word does not have a definition. Just put together any combination of letters and make a new word and then go around calling somebody that consistently. You can drive the person crazy if you don't give the word a definition. That's all you have to do. That's the one thing you don't do. Don't give the word a definition, but always apply the word to that person. Just on the experiments, you can do that. You can do that on a job, uh, you know, uh, around people that you know. Just pick out one person and call that person that name, a name that you never heard before, a name that the person never heard before, but you say it applies to that person, but you don't give it a definition. You don't say it means the same as a goat or the same as a monkey or the same as a rabbit or the, or the same as the sky or a tree. It has no definition at all. But you call this person that. Every time you get angry with them or something like that, every time, you know, you call them by that name, you can drive the person crazy because they don't know what you're calling them. That's the key. It's supposed to be something terrible, but you don't know what it is. And that's what they have done with the word nigger. The word nigger has no definition. Most people hadn't even noticed that. Most dictionaries will say nigger, the word nigger, is a derogatory term for a person who is a Negro, black, person of African descent. But the key term here is derogatory. But the key element in that word derogatory is 
They don't tell you why it's derogatory. And that's what gives the word its power. If they say nigger means stupid person, that word would disappear. Would have disappeared a long time ago. Doesn't mean stupid person. It's just a derogatory word that's applied to a dark skinned person. But they don't tell you why it's derogatory, and that is key. If they ever tell you why, the word will disappear on its own. Hmm. A few years back, there was a word that came up that most people had never heard of before called makaka. A dark-skinned person was called a makaka. And so someone instantly said, what's that? What is he calling him? See, people became baffled and people became angry. <laughs> okay, but here's what. Someone looked it up. And they said, Makaka is a species of monkey in Southeast Asia. And they said, oh, a Makaka is a monkey. He called me a monkey. Now, the word is not as powerful as the word nigger. Nowhere close to it. And nobody really cares about being called a Makaka because it means monkey. In other words, the word has a definition. Even though the definition is supposed to be derogatory, I mean, a monkey is a monkey. You know at least that you're being called a monkey. And being called a monkey has no power. Like the word nigger, that doesn't have a definition and has all kinds of power. Because it has no definition. Nigger does not mean monkey. What does it mean? Nobody knows. But you apply it to a dark-skinned person. But it has no definition. Black people used to try to give it a definition, say, oh, it means a vile person, a stupid person, you know. But the white supremacists said, no, that's not what it means. And when the black person said, well, what does it mean if it don't mean a vile person or a stupid person? You don't know, do you? And then they laugh. See, that's how they got you. And they got us forever. They got all the professors pulling the air out. Because you can drive people crazy with a word that doesn't have a definition. And we hadn't detected that in all these years. The word has no definition. That's where its power comes from. Hmm. The the non-white people that I have heard, black people who get upset about that word being used and, and feel like it, it should not be used by anyone, um, I've never heard them say that they're upset because they don't know what the word means. That's because no one has said that. I don't think you have ever heard anybody say that except me. That is true, sir. And I stumbled up on it after I looked at it because I try to deal in words. Mm. You know, I stumbled up on that after I got serious about looking looking it up. Years ago, I looked in different dictionaries, encyclopedias, People were saying, well, it goes back to an old Spanish word with its root causes in Negro. When then it went from Negro to nigger as a slang, you know, but it basically it means the same thing. That didn't still tell me. That didn't tell me anything about where it gets its power from. And then it clicked after I kept seeing the word derogatory, derogatory. But then I asked the next logical question. Why is it derogatory? No one was asking this question. No one. In all these years, hundreds of years, the obvious question, why is it derogatory? Because part of the code says in all the questioning, in everything that comes up, you always ask why. You know, why is the moon in the sky? Why isn't it sitting on top of a mountain? You know, you really get to the essence of things when you ask why. You can ask how, where, when, how many, but you always in that mix ask why, as in every circumstance. 
I have that in the code book. Always ask that question, why? That's got to be in there somewhere. Why are you doing this? Why are you going there? Along with what and how, you ask why. That's key. So I asked the question, why is the word nigger derogatory? And nobody was given an answer, and that's the key. Not supposed to be an answer. Because when you give it a why, when you say, and then you get to the what, see, that why will lead you to a what. And once you get to the what, then the word starts losing power. So you don't give it a definition. That's a no-no. I don't care what word you use, but if you want to really baffle people, get people upset, come up with a word that has no definition, but use the word like it does have a definition, but that nobody knows what it is but you. You can drive everybody running around in circles, have them screaming and yelling, and don't even know what they're screaming and yelling about. So you feel like with with black people, they're not upset when they say they're angry about the term nigger. They're not upset about, um, you know, the things they say. What happened 50, 60 years ago, and that's what white people called us, uh, who were racist, and lynchings and all that, that's not really what they're upset about. They're upset because they don't understand what that term means. They have no knowledge of what the word means because there's no way to find out what the word means. That's the key. Because the word doesn't have any meaning, except it's supposed to be derogatory, but they don't tell you why. Mm. Derogatory, but why? Well, it applies to you, and it's derogatory. Okay, well, it applies to me. I got that part. But why is this derogatory about me? I ain't going to take it. I'm going to let you figure it out. See, and that's when you start going crazy trying to figure it out. Because there's nothing to figure. (laughs) That's why you're going crazy. You'll never get to the root of it. (laughs) Because it has no definition. You can't figure out what a person is saying about you if they're using a word that has no definition. But they are using the word, and they're saying it applies to you. See, people were becoming upset. They were becoming angry about the term macaca until somebody did some research and found out macaca is just a species of monkey. That's all it is. Not nothing else. Just a species of monkey. So the person says, oh, what the guy did was call me a monkey. Well, you know, what's new about being called a monkey? You know, anybody can be called a monkey, you know. Monkey business, I mean, you know, <laughs> whatever. You know, what is a monkey? Well, it's a monkey. A monkey is a monkey. You know, you can study a monkey. I mean, you know, some people have monkeys for pets. I mean, you know, a monkey is a monkey. A cow is a cow. You know, the guy calls a female a bitch. Well, what's a bitch? Bitch is a female dog. Oh, he's calling me a female dog. Well, now, you know. That does bother me some, but, I mean, you know, hey, a dog is a dog. There's a lot of female dogs and whatnot, I mean, you know. And, but I ain't made like a dog. I don't look like a dog. I mean, you know, people might call me a dog, but that's not really what I am, you know. In fact, you can almost make a joke out of it. I mean, you know, guys call each other dogs and all like this, see, you know. <laughs> Could you hold the phone just a second? Yes, sir. Yes, Could sir. You? All yes, right. Sir. Uh, context of white supremacy, Gusty Renegade, uh, special guest, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr. Uh, he's a regular at the Cows now. His, his uh, sixth appearance uh, here at the Cows, hopefully uh, constructive uh, information. Always uh, treat be able to speak with Mr. Fuller. Um, again, check the blog, racism-notes.blogspot.com, racism-notes.blogspot.com if you'd like to make uh, any donation to the Cows. Uh, you can look at the blog, uh, PayPal account is set up there, top right of the page, you can click on it, and uh, if you would like to support 
Um, again, MacBook Pro, I do not have a computer. Um, have done over 70 programs without a computer. Hello? Yes, sir. I'm here. Okay, okay. Uh, again, our guest, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., author of the United Independent Compensatory Food System Concept. Um, Mr. Fuller, I've heard you speak about uh, population tailoring and how uh, the white supremacists, uh, they, they don't look to kill all of the non-white people. They just want to keep the numbers uh, to their liking uh, so that they, the non-white people population is not getting out of control. Um, have you uh, heard anything in terms of uh, racist man, uh, racist man and racist woman um, using uh, abortion to tailor the non-white populations? Uh, have you heard any information about that? Anything that is being done comes under suspicion. If it's the racist who you suspect is being behind it, and anything that is directed toward white people that they didn't do themselves uh, should be in that category. Be, just be suspicious of it. Could you hold again? Just yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Again, MacBook Pro uh, by uh, August fifth, two thousand ten. Uh, where the cows will end. Uh, not Hello? A yes, sir. Yes, I'm here. Okay. Um, so you said there should be uh, suspicion, anything that is directed at non-white people that non-white people did not think of themselves. Uh, and if you have a, a suspicion that a uh, racist man and or racist woman was involved in some way, there should be suspicion uh, about the ultimate objective. Uh, if it involves non-white people, you automatically it goes in the suspect uh, computer. That you know that that bell goes off on the computer. This comes under suspicion. It involves white people with non-white people. You suspect a racist may have something to do with it. Ring the bell. Huh. You know, automatically, until you look into it and see if, whether it's going to fall into the constructive a non-constructive category, and you might have to do some studying in depth to make that determination because you should do some studying in depth because the first reports that you get may sound like it's something constructive, but if you look behind it, it will be something that appears to be constructive that's leading to something non-constructive because that is the pattern. They are, the, they, they are masters of deceit, so you always have to look in depth. You know, they always come with the tell you what I'm going to do approach. Tell you what I'm going to do to help you. Be suspicious. Be suspicious. Be suspicious. Doubt that what you see on the surface is the real deal. Have that doubt. What, uh, what would you say to the non-white person? who says, uh, you know, Mr. Fuller, you, you sound really paranoid, uh, as though, you know, you, you cannot uh, trust that, you know, someone, a white person would be sincere and offering to help you. Um, that just that sounds really unreasonable, uh, the way you are, uh, pre the presentation that you just gave sounds very unreasonable. What would your response be in terms of why that is a logical stance to take as a victim of white supremacy? That's a recommendation. It's a suggestion that's according to uh, counter racist logic historically. Now, a person doesn't have to do it. They can right. say, hey, you know, I'm going with it. I'm not investigating anything. I'm not being suspicious. I'm going to trust all, or, all together. I'm going to sign on the dotted line. I'm not second yet. Whatever they tell me, that's okay with me. Go ahead and do it. That's the best way to find out from experience <laughs> what's going to happen. <laughs> wow. Yeah, the, yeah, see, I mean, it's it's totally, everything in counter-racist logic is democratic. Mm -hmm. That if you insist on going that way, now you've been told it's best to be suspicious. A little bit cautious. But if you just want to, you know, throw yourself on the sword, so to speak, go ahead and then see if you like it. That way you'll know. I always say, don't listen to Neely Fuller. Follow the logic. 
follow precedent, follow what you have studied. Don't listen to follow the logic. Don't listen listen to Neely Fuller, I mean, you know, but follow the logic. Don't follow Neely Fuller nowhere. He makes mistakes. He might be making a mistake by making this assessment. So if you think that he is, try it yourself. Go by your own experience and the experience of others around you and see how it works out. Either the system of white supremacy is in place or it isn't. It'll prove itself. Either the system of deception and harm is in place or it isn't. If you think that it isn't, try it on for size in every area of activity. Give it an excellent test. See how it works out. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, I am uh, I'm just curious. Uh, you, you began working on the code book that you authored some years ago, um, when you first wrote the code book, um, what type of impact did you think that was going to have on non-white people? Did you think that was something that you would be still giving lectures and talking about uh, 20, 30 years later? Uh, did you think it would have a bigger impact? Just, you know, what were your expectations when you uh, published the code publicly? I didn't expect any constructive reaction at all. I didn't then, and I don't now anytime soon. In fact, I didn't set a timetable. I set a timetable for myself. I said that I wanted to solve the race problem in five years. That's what I told people at the time. I'd like to solve the entire race problem. I said, there's no point in just pecking around at it. I say when you sit down and start mapping out a strategy, map out, map the strategy out, with the intent of solving the race problem no later than a 10-year bracket, but preferably in a five-year bracket, because you then very popular, was very popular in a lot of uh, situations to make up a five-year plan. So I said, now, any black person that sits down talking about race should be making up a five-year plan. Solve the entire race problem in five years with all the bells and whistles. Okay, that takes a lot of thought. And so that was my intent. But when it didn't happen, I wasn't disappointed. That was just a goal, you know. But I didn't think that I could pull it off. And I thought that the codified codified approach would be slow going. And even at this late date, I still think it will be slow going. See, because necessity is the mother of invention. Black people are pretty well, in, you know, even if you're talking about overseas among the African tribes, you're talking about thousands of years of people being set in their ways, do not want to change anything, you know, and being victimized as a custom. And so... It's it's uh, you know it's a slow process except it doesn't have to be because it can change overnight. Now that's one thing that, that I envision, but I can't pinpoint when that will be. You just keep doing it and keep doing it. It's like chipping away and chipping away and chipping away at that tree. You know you're chopping and no you know the chips are flying and whatnot, but the tree is not budging. And you rest, and then you go back to doing it again, and then you rest, and go, and the tree is just like it was when you first start chopping ten years ago. It hasn't moved. It's a pretty solid tree, but at some point, oops, there goes another rubber tree plant. But you don't know exactly when that'll happen. That's why the people shout out, the people who cut down trees, you know, even with modern equipment, they shout out timber, you know. They don't know the exact moment that they're going to be shouting. You know, they have to be ready to shout at any time. 
September, because the tree is getting ready to fall. We thought that it would be another half an hour before it would, before it would fall, or even begin to tilt. Turned out it was 15 minutes, all right, maybe six minutes. We projected a half an hour. But when we started actually cutting, that thing started falling in about four minutes. And we had to all scramble to get out of the way. Huh. You know? And that's the way I envision the system of racism. But you've got to chip away. You've got to keep chipping. You don't get discouraged. Because what else are you going to do anyway? You're in the timber business. This is the business you have chosen. Um, I, I have heard non-white people uh, who incidentally have not been uh, chipping away for quite as, as long as you have, uh, but they said, you know, this, uh, this gets old, uh, this is tiring, uh, I don't see any impact, I don't see, this, I don't see the, any evidence that the tree is about to fall. Um, I, I don't think, you know, this is, I don't think this is a good use of time. I think, you know, I'd rather not be uh, working to replace white supremacy with justice. Um, how do you, uh, how do you not, how do you avoid getting discouraged uh, doing this work uh, and still being a victim of white supremacy? By looking at my options. I have taken that view because the code requires that I do. Okay, Phil, if you're not doing this, what are you supposed to be doing? And when I shop around, I come right back where I started. No, this is what I'm supposed to be doing. Why? Because what's my option? Well, do something else. Something else like what? Anytime I get away from this, I begin to feel stupid. And that's how I came to the conclusion that, according to logic, this is the assignment of black people. Replace the system of racism with a better system. Presumably that system would be justice, since racism is all about non-justice. And when you're doing anything else, you begin to feel and act stupid, and anybody who has tried it has found that out. Hmm. You said when you got away from working to replace white supremacy with justice. I started out trying to get away from racism and even dealing with it and all like that. And everything that I was doing was stupid. Hmm. I felt stupid. I felt aimless. I began to drift. I began to do all kinds of stupid things because I wasn't on my assignment. That's how you know when you're on your assignment. You start making sense to yourself, not to somebody else. You start making sense to yourself, likely for the first time. Otherwise, you're just doing stuff, going here, going there, with no objective. You begin to examine, what am I here for? What am I doing, and what am I doing it for? In order to accomplish what? So you come up with abstractions like, well, I'm trying to be happy. Be happy doing what? Are you happy? Are you happy for very long doing what? Sitting somewhere in somebody's, you know, uh, living room, uh, you know, uh, snorting cocaine? I never did that. You know, I could examine it, and I say, no, I don't think that that would, you know, that ain't what I want to do. Okay, you don't want to do that, Fuller. What do you want to do? Well, maybe I should go climb a mountain. I never did that either. But if I did it, at some point, I would ask myself, why am I climbing this mountain? Well, climb mountains for the same reason the people climb mountains, because it's there. Okay, well, that is an activity, but is it a priority? Well, you can make it a priority. Well, is there something else I could be doing that I would 
feel better about. You know, I don't have anything against mountain climbing. But, you know, if I did it, once I got to the top and then climbed back down and breathed a sigh of relief that I didn't fall, now what? Well, it's an experience. Okay, so I experienced that. Been there, done that. What's next? What project do you have? I found that I got more out of something that's a real problem in trying to solve it, whether I solved it or not. And that's when things start making sense to me. Because the biggest problem is the race problem. So why not work on that? Mountain climbing is not a problem. And lots of people have climbed mountains successfully. So what am I actually doing except getting some exercise and endangering my existence in the process? I learned a little something. There's nothing incorrect about that. I'm not knocking it. But is this a priority? I didn't make it a priority. I did not go around, wake up in the morning, thinking about what I want to do is go to Idaho and climb a mountain. Or climb Mount Kilimanjaro. I could have made that a lifetime priority. I didn't see fit to do that. It's a matter of what you see fit to do and why you're doing it. That's the main thing, getting back to that word why. Why are you doing this? I was asked that by an investigator once while I was at a meeting. Someone came to me and said, see that light-skinned black guy over there with the hair slicked back? I said, yeah. They said, don't talk to him because he's from the Justice Department. I said, that's exactly who I want to talk to. I want to talk to anybody who's about justice. So I went over and started talking to him, and he started writing down the stuff that I was saying. I don't know what he wrote to this day. But he started writing. He said, wait a minute. And he whipped out his pad and started writing. And then at some point he stopped writing and he said, uh, I got a question. And I said, yes. He said, why are you doing what you are doing? Because I was talking code talk. I was at a meeting talking code talk. This is back in the 19, early 1970s, late 1960s. And he said, why are you doing what you are doing? I said, what else do I have to do in life that makes sense? Hmm. And his, his, he blinked, looked at me and blinked, and then he fell out laughing. And then he looked at me and blinked again, and he fell out laughing again. Because I think it's, it came to him, yeah, maybe you're right, you know. What else do you have to do in life? And he probably got to thinking about himself. What else do I have to do in life? You know, that's why I'm talking to you now. You know, <laughs> see what I mean? So we had a grand old time for the time that we talked. See, but people were telling me don't talk to him because he's from the Justice Department. Why wouldn't I talk to anybody from the Justice Department? And I'm going around talking about justice all the time. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, show me somebody who's talking about justice. You know, I'm not going to talk to them. Who else am I going to talk to? <laughs> That's the logic. Did, did he have constructive information? No, he just asked me questions about what I was doing, what I was doing at the meeting, you know, what my philosophy was and all that. And I told him, hey, it's all about justice. I ain't hiding, you know. <laughs> And then we all, you know, my position was we're all working together, aren't we? You know? <laughs> yeah, but some guy came up to me and said, Fuller, you know, beware of him. Say, man, he's going around, moving around. He's from the Justice Department. I said, oh, man, that's who I'm looking for. You know? <laughs> that's why I came here to the meeting. You know? Justice? Man, that's me. You know? <laughs> Talking about don't talk to him. <laughs> I definitely want to talk to him. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Don't get no better than that, you know, and I still say the same thing. I say the Justice Department wants to talk to you. Oh, wow, welcome. <laughs> Let's sit right down, you know. It's 
pour some tea. Everybody get comfortable. <laughs> I'm looking forward to this. <laughs> right. Getting rid of racism and producing justice. It, man, that's that's motherhood, apple pie, Mount Kilimanjaro. That's everything wrapped in one package. <laughs> wow. Wow. So I we've got to learn how, how to think about things, you know, pay attention to things. Words. Department of Justice, you know, I didn't even know a such thing as that, you know. I'm glad that it is, you know. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Should have had it a long time ago. Where have you been, you know? <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm just assuming, have you ever had um, any time since you have uh, begun devoting uh, more of your time and energy to replacing white supremacy with justice, has there in, been any moment where you have felt uh, wow, this this uh, this racism thing, studying racism and focusing on that is, is not, uh, I'm not enjoying this. I wish I was not informed about racism, white supremacy anymore. Uh, have you ever had a moment where you felt that way? No, oh, I never enjoyed it, you know, because it's work, mm. you know, but at the same time I do enjoy it because it's work. If you start talking about enjoying because the options, see what I mean? Mm-hmm. What else? I, I told him. What else do I have to do in life? See, I'm on a slave ship. Getting off the slave ship, you know, <laughs> that's like breathing. <laughs> I mean, you know that. I ain't got no options. What's my option? I'm on a slave <laughs> ship. I'm trying to get off the cotton picker slave ship. <laughs> you know? You know? I mean, do you have to ask me this question? I, I was born on a slave ship. I'm on the slave ship. I'm trying to get the heck off of this ship. This is a slave ship. This ain't no luxury ladder. <laughs> you know? And you ask me why am I trying to get off the slave ship? I'm trying to get off the slave ship because it's a slave ship. <laughs> it's a no-brainer. <laughs> I mean, Wow, man. Maybe that shows some of our victimization. That, yeah, uh, you know, yeah. So, uh, yeah, so now evil. sometimes I might get a little, you know, I, I get sleep, you know, and, and all like that. But this is what I'm trying to do. Could you hold it just a minute? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Right. Uh, again, Mr. Neely Fuller, Jr., uh, author of the United Independent Compensatory Code System Concept. Um Yes, I'm here. Oh, okay, okay. Um, yeah, Doctor Doctor Welsing, Doctor Francis Cress Welsing, she was here um, about a month ago, and uh, she said that a lot of uh, non-white people had had recently asked her the exact same question about you know why and how you know are you able to to maintain and, and continue to do this work uh, for thirty, forty years. And uh, she she said something very similar. She said, you know, I'm I'm a victim of white supremacy. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. This is this is. She, I don't think she said assignment, but it was very close. This is what I'm supposed to be doing in a system of injustice. I'm supposed to be uh, attempting to replace white supremacy with justice. That's that's your focus. I mean, what's more important than that? Um, yeah. Yeah. I, I I just I hear a lot of non-white people who say, you know, it just. It gets tiring. They don't see any progress. Um, don't see, you know, any evidence that 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 that, tr- that that tree is coming down. They don't see any evidence that the work that they're doing is having an impact. And it just they feel like, uh, you know, just giving up and and saying, you know, I just I'll always be a victim. I'll just have to deal with it. Um, but you know, you and Dr. Welsing seem like you uh, that hasn't been a big problem for you all, and just. Uh, staying focused uh, on replacing white supremacy with justice. And the key thing that that keeps you in that lane, so to speak, is what are your options? Mm. See what I mean? When you start looking around for something else to do and you start making an assessment, even before you get into it, the more you look look at it, the less sense it makes. Mm. See what I mean? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. This is why you have people like Frederick Douglass, uh, Patrice Lumumba, Nelson Mandela, Jesse Jackson, 
uh, uh, Gandhi. Mm-hmm. Gandhi started out being a lawyer. His ambition was, you know, to learn all the law that he could in London and then go back to India and make an uh, excellent living. Or go uh, His first stop was South Africa, make an excellent living getting Indians who were in trouble out of jail. Mm-hmm. Okay? That was his ambition until he got thrown off that train for being black. For being called a little Sammy. That was the you know, the equivalent of nigger in those days. Yes, sir. Okay. And then that's when he said, Hey, I got a greater purpose than just, you know, walking around with a suit and tie here in South Africa and being a respectable Indian in the Indian quarter. Getting down and out Indians out of trouble with white folks. Mm-hmm. He said, That's a shallow ambition. I'm going on the world stage. That's a bigger ambition. See what I mean? Yes, sir. And he did. He said, no, you know, hey, I'm going for the juggler. I'm not going to just fool around with this Penny Annie stuff because this is Penny Annie. You know, and me getting thrown off that train, they didn't pay any attention to my credentials as a lawyer. They didn't care. They said I was sitting in a first-class seat, and somebody with a dark skin ain't got no business sitting in first class. And that's why they threw me off the train, because I was too dark to be sitting in the first-class section of this British train. And they threw me off the train, even even after I told them that I got my education in London and was ready ready to show them my credentials. He didn't care anything about that. The conductor said, in his exact words, get your black ass back in third class. I'll have you thrown off the train, which they did. Threw me off the train. And Mohandas Gandhi, from that point on, says, hey, <laughs> since i got to be on this planet and i got to put up with stuff, I might as well do it on a big scale. <laughs> Wow. wow. Otherwise, he'd have just been another so-called successful Hindu lawyer in South Africa. Also ran, okay. Mm. But now there are statues to Gandhi almost everywhere. Martin Luther King got a lot of his influence from Gandhi, okay. In other words, hey, go for the big picture. And people, all the black people who have any name recognition. For the most part, you know, Malcolm X, Elijah Muhammad, Martin Luther King, Fannie Lou Hamer, the list is long. These are people who were grappling with racism. You want to be distinctive, that's what you do. But not for the purpose of being distinctive. It's for the purpose of this should be your assignment, because it is. This is why you put in the condition that you're in. Get off of that slave ship and put the slave business out of business. In the process of getting off the ship, you're putting the shipping industry of slaves out of business. Why? Because you were put on the slave ship, so that's your assignment. Hey, you could have been, you know, somewhere else, born somewhere on, like I said, on the planet Krypton. In which case, you would be solving problems on the planet Krypton. Which might be producing some more stars, I mean, satellites and whatnot, you know. That might be your assignment on the planet Krypton. Or trying to find out, I mean, how to rescue the people who were trapped inside the planet. In the core of the planet. 10,000 years ago. They've been down there 10,000 years, same people. Because they never die. But they've been trying to get to the surface. So you're trying to dig and get to the surface. Because the planet Krypton might be the biggest planet ever. The biggest so-called heavenly body ever. Trillions and trillions and trillions and trillions of miles in circumference. 
that might be what's going on on such a planet, somewhere out there. So they're dealing with the problems there. We deal with the problems here. Biggest problem is racism at this particular time. And you are put right in the middle of the problem. That's why you know that's the problem you're supposed to be working on. You know, you could have been on some other planet, but you were put on this one. So you stretch and yawn and say, what am I doing here? That's the logical process. Well, you're here to solve problems. Well, problem like what? Well, you wait a five Wait five or ten minutes. It'll hit you. <laughs> so some white person walks up and slaps you in the face. Say, okay, now you got the message? <laughs> now I'm out of here now, so you work on the problem. I'm leaving you with it. <laughs> um, again, Mr. Uh, Neely Pullen, Jr., um, I, I thought that was really key. Um, you said that uh, when, when you began your efforts to replace white supremacy with justice, you wanted to solve the entire global system of racism in five years. Otherwise, why try? Why even? You know, why just peck around at something? I mean, like it's some kind of hobby. You know, it's not supposed to be a hobby. This is a project, a lifetime project until it's all done. Then you get another project if you still got some time left. See, but you know, grab you know, grab the major project simply and, and for a very logical reason, it's a project that is affecting you. It's not like something you go hunting for. You're not looking for a problem, you got a problem. The biggest problem on the planet. You put right in the middle of it. That means you're supposed to be working on that problem. And I gave that illustration. Why am I trying to get off the slave ship and dealing with the slave ship? Because I'm on it. That's why. <laughs> and I'm not supposed to be. <laughs> you know, my logic tells me this. So it's a no-brainer, you know. Wow. Yeah. That, that just strikes me uh, because so many other people that I hear who allege to be working against racism, white supremacy, they always say, well, you know, this. I don't expect this problem to be solved in my lifetime or your lifetime. It's uh, something that they either say it will always be here or I suspect it's going to take hundreds of years uh, to, to solve this problem. So you look at them and ask them a very logical question. Okay, having taken that position, what are you going to do now? What's your ambition? Name it. Take out your pen and pad. What are all the things you're going to do now, now that you have decided you're not going to deal with racism? <laughs> now, I'm going to start enumer you know, enumerate them. Yeah, I'm going to write them down as you enumerate them. All these wonderful things. I mean, even Mr., you know, uh, what's his name, Mr. Johnson and whatnot, he said, hey, I'm going to be an entrepreneur. I'm going to be a businessman, you know. But what did he do? He came up with a... Idea. And what was the idea? B-E-T. What's B-E-T? Black Entertainment Tonight. Now just look at it. Black Entertainment Tonight. A reaction to racism. See what I mean? You, you're saying that B -E -T. Mr. Graves, well, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to deal with business. Mm -hmm. What business? Well, I, I think I might make a magazine. What kind of magazine? You know? Well, a magazine about business. What kind of business? Black Enterprise. A reaction to white supremacy. Hmm. See, it always leads there anyway. I don't care where you start out. Why? Why do you? I'm say going to have a barber shop. Oh, you gonna have a? I'm gonna have the best barber shop. I mean, in first class. Huh. Well, barbers. What do barbers do? They cut hair. Whose hair? 
When? Where? Oh, well, I think that a good spot for my barbershop will be Martin Luther King Avenue. (laughs) I don't have time to be bothered with all this old black nationalist stuff and all like that. Oh, you don't? (laughs) But you can have a barbershop on Martin Luther King Avenue. (laughs) Stop and think about what you're saying. (laughs) Can can you... uh explain why, uh, in your view, BET and Black Enterprise Magazine and the Black Barbershop, how those are responses to racism, white supremacy? Look at the titles. Black Entertainment Tonight. Not Entertainment Tonight. They already got that. Black Entertainment Tonight. B-E-T. Magazine. Black Enterprise. Oh, I'm going to be a movie maker. You know, I'm going to, you know, I've been studying Jack Warner and all these other movie makers out here. You know, I'm black, but I'm going to make a movie because I ain't going to be bothered with all this old black stuff. I ain't got time to be talking about that. But when you make a movie and you're black, it's loaded up with black people. Cast of characters. Yeah, you're a black movie maker and loaded with black folks. <laughs> hmm. mm-hmm. Wow. So you would say these would be examples of... These are reactions to the system of white supremacy. Okay, okay. Because if you're black, that's all you're doing anyway, regardless of what you call it. You're reacting to the system of white supremacy. Mm-hmm. And replacing white supremacy with justice, attempting to do that, that is also a reaction to racism, white supremacy? Sure. You wouldn't be replacing white supremacy with justice if white supremacy didn't exist. Mm. How are you going to replace something with something that doesn't exist? Hmm. Hmm. I guess, so by that logic... uh, See, so when black people say, well, I'm not going to be involved in no blackness and all like that, see, I know where it's going because, I see, I tried that right from the beginning. That's how I got started. I don't, I'm trying to get, I'm going to run away from this thing called racism. But I found that there was no place to run. That was my ambition when I started out. You know, I wanted to be a cartoonist. So I found out because of racism, that was a, you know, that was a problem. That became a problem with, uh, which, Mr. Magruder. See? What, who? My characters are going to be black. So I'm reacting to racism right there, okay? Mr. Aaron Magruder and Boondocks. Yes, sir. See what I mean? So, you know, hey, it's nowhere to run. See, so I, I gave up the idea of being a cartoonist. So I said, well, now what am I going to be? I don't know. But I know that I'm going to find some place where color don't make no difference. And so I thought that traveling would do that. And in 1957, that's when that black sergeant informed me in Japan. He said, Fuller, you're running all over the world trying to find an ideal situation. That's the way he put it. You're looking for paradise. He said, Fuller, it doesn't exist. And if you want to make it, if you want one, you're going to have to make it. If you want an ideal situation, you're going to have to make it. That was devastating to me. Because I had the perspective, this planet is pretty big. So I'm going to try to find some place. I don't care how long it takes. I'm going to spend all my time searching for that place where black people and white people and everybody is all together and whatnot, and color don't make no difference. I'm looking for that utopia. It's got to be somewhere on this planet. But this black sergeant said, all these places you're talking about going, well, I've been there. The places I haven't been, I've heard enough about them. He said, none of them are ideal. And he could have had it for you. (laughs) All right. But he didn't do that. But he knew what I was doing. He said, I've been studying you, Fuller. He said, that's what you're doing. 
said, you're one of these. He said, I make it my business to study people, and I've been watching you. He said, you're one of these people looking for an ideal situation. And I'm going to tell you right now, there's no such thing as that. No such thing as an ideal situation, and if you want one, you're going to have to produce it. That was devastating to me because that's exactly what I was doing. But I was trying to hide it and hide it even from myself. But he could see through it. It cuts pretty deep when somebody can look at you and size you up right quick. Okay? <laughs> and he sized me up right quick and got to the truth real quick and revealed it to me. And then he approached it logically. He said, look at you, Fuller. He said, why would anybody work hard and set up an ideal situation anywhere for you to come flop down in? He said, what is it about you that's so magic, you know? <laughs> So why would anybody do that? Ask yourself that. Why would anybody set up a paradise for you and just stand there waiting on you to come and enjoy it? What is it about you that anybody would want to do that? Do you have that much going for you? And if so, how? What? Every time he said something like that with every sentence, I was feeling smaller and smaller. <laughs> but it helped me. So she said, he gave me the formula. Hey, if you want that paradise, you're going to have to produce it. In so many words, and this is a term he used all the time. You grab armloads of work and you do it with glee, you know. <laughs> He said, that's the formula. Don't try to run. There's nowhere to run. That told me a whole lot. Just one conversation. That little conversation took less than 10 minutes. But he told me enough. He gave me a lifetime reference right there in 10 minutes that nobody had ever put it out there like that before. That was 1957. Now, I didn't like it, but when I thought about it, I said, hey, it hurts, but it makes sense. You know? I said, he's correct. It makes sense. Wow. So I'm going to stop trying to find a place where nobody knows I'm colored. You know? Uh -huh. Wow. Yeah. I, I have heard a lot of victims um, say the same thing, really, that, you know, they were, they were looking at it. They got different ways of saying it, but that's what they mean. Yes, yes, that they are just looking for their escape uh, yeah. from racism, white supremacy. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they, I, sometimes you hear terms like, I got to get out of the ghetto. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. See, but compensatory logic says, when you move, it moves. Mm. You are the ghetto. The ghetto isn't a place. The ghetto is you. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Wow. That wherever Your the mind has been ghettoized, and wherever wow. you go, you take it with you. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, I, I have not met a single non-white person as of yet who has been able to escape from racism, white supremacy. Mm -hmm. um, they have said, though, that that fact, even though it's true, is very depressing. Um, do you, I guess, do you have any suggestions for how you go about uh, the business of attempting to replace white supremacy with justice uh, without it becoming something that depresses you or depresses other people, uh, just speaking honestly about the pitiful state of non-white people? It's the yin and yang. You're supposed to know that it's depressing because it's supposed to be. Huh. And I'll make a recent parable in the movie Band of Brothers. Uh -huh. One of the officers came up to one of the soldiers in World War II, one of the other officers, and said, I'm going to tell you right now, Lieutenant. I think it was a lieutenant. He says, uh, if you stay in this position, if you don't get your men out of here, you're going to be surrounded. And he looked at him and said, 
We are paratroopers. We're supposed to be surrounded. And that's a lesson in that right there. In other words, hey, I'm black in a system of white supremacy. I'm supposed to be assaulted. See what I mean? I'm supposed to be surrounded by enemies. (laughs) This is my job. You know, you're not telling me nothing new. (laughs) And that's what the lieutenant meant. Say, hey, we're not just like anybody else. We're paratroopers. Being surrounded is our specialty. We're supposed to fight our way out of being surrounded, you know. That's why we drop behind enemy lines. We're supposed to be surrounded by the enemy. You're not just talking about any soldiers. We're specialists. See what I mean? Yes, sir. Say, sir, we're paratroopers. We're supposed to be surrounded. <laughs> and so see, that, and that, that's a, see, it's a matter of perspective. Mm-hmm. See, other soldiers panic when they're surrounded. Oh, my goodness, they're going to surround us. we got to get out of here. Oh, my God, this is Armageddon, you know. Paratroopers say, hey, we put ourselves in positions where we know we're being surrounded, you know. We deliberately do that. We go in harm's way, deliberately. That's our piece of cake. <laughs> wow. Yeah. So the... Uh informed as a, a black person in the system of white supremacy. Yes, a black person in the system of white supremacy said, I'm supposed to be surrounded by, you know, blinking lights and whatnot, you know. <laughs> People, you know, telling me, you know, pulling me over saying, get out, boy, put your hands in the air, you know, right. Mm-hmm. Put your hands on top of the car, <laughs> you know. What are you niggas doing hanging around here? Well, that's the way I'm supposed to be talked to. You know, hey, this is a war. This ain't a picnic. <laughs> wow. Yeah. Wow. Um, again, I, I don't want to take up your whole morning out. Yeah. It's just the last question. Um, it's I, I still encounter a lot of non-white people who are very confused about the fact that uh, what we call race uh, is not a biological category, that it is a political category, uh, and that the white people who practice racism, white supremacy, they decide racial classifications in a system of white supremacy. Uh, could you explain that uh, for our listeners, non-white listeners especially, so they can understand that? Uh, we'll make that the last one. Okay. Now, uh, an example is under what they call so-called apartheid in South Africa. Mm-hmm. During that era, quote, unquote, a Japanese person, person born in Japan coming to South Africa to do business with white people as a representative of business people in Japan would be, during the time he's there, he or she would be classified as honor white. In other words, they could go wherever the white people went do what white people do. Now, that same Japanese person may have a brother that was born and raised in South Africa and was a so-called citizen of South Africa. That's his brother, born of the same mother. He would be classified as non-white and treated as such and could not move outside of that category or do the things that white people do. But his brother, coming from Japan on a visa, on a passport, and he's going to be there six months, He could do everything that the white people do. Go where the white people go. Why? Because the white supremacist said so. That's why. Same biological people. But the white supremacists say, this is what you can do according to what we say. See, so racism is biological, but the decisions are made on the basis of political. You can be a white person for 60 days or for six months. Why? Because I said so. That's why. See, but I'm the same as my brother there. I can't even talk to my brother. I can't go to the same restaurants where he goes, anything like that. Yeah, you can't do that. Well, why can't I do that? That's my brother. You know, we're both Japanese and all like that. You can't do that because I said so. 
Well, what are you basing that on? I'm basing that on, I'm saying that he's not white. And I'm saying that you are. But you're only white for six months. You overstay your visa, you're non-white. Because you violated my law. Period. But that doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to who? It doesn't make sense to me. Now, you just answered your own question. <laughs> Again, Mr. Dealey Fuller, Jr., uh, I hope more non-white people will begin to understand that when it comes to uh, racism, white supremacy, that uh, that's what it means, uh, because I say so. Uh, that's from a white person, uh, male or female. Um, could you please uh, give uh, our listeners, uh, folks, information on how they can get a copy of your book. Uh, Just United call States. my number, 202-484-5461. That's the textbook for victims of racism. Just call it the code. I'll know what it is. Okay. 202-484-5461. 202-484-5461. And I'm in and out a lot, but mostly I'm in. And uh, they can get the information as to how to get the book directly from me. Outstanding. Uh, always, as I said, a pleasure to uh, be able to exchange views with you. Um, hopefully uh, constructive information was shared. I hope uh, listeners enjoyed it. Uh, That'll be three programs. Uh, I'll work and uh, see if I can get all three of those on a disc and, and just mail them all together like the last package uh, so you can uh, evaluate uh, what you said on the program. Um, thank you for taking some of your time out of your uh, schedule. To well, I'm doing, I'm doing my job, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> Trying to, anyway. I, I appreciate it. I, I think uh, job well done for the day, I think. Uh, hopefully we'll be a little closer to uh, knocking the tree down, replacing white supremacy with justice. Um, thank you so much. I will definitely be in touch. Hopefully we can have you back on the program again soon. Yes, sir, and I'd like to have these, those recordings, like you said, because I do like to critique what I'm doing, because I do make mistakes, but mm -hmm. I try to minimize them as I go along. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I will I will work on getting uh, the three recordings uh, from the last three times you've been on the program so you can evaluate your work, sir. All right. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Good morning. Of white supremacy, Gus T. Renegade, uh, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., his uh, sixth appearance uh, on the cows. Um, if you uh, appreciate uh, what Mr. Fuller has to say, make sure you check the archives so you can uh, find all the times he has been uh, a guest on the program. Um, I can tell you he was here in May. Uh, he was here again. Uh, he was here in May, and then he's been here every month since October. So, um, May, October, all the way through January, uh, and if this is the second time he's been here uh, this first week in January 2010. Um, been very active first week uh, of 2010. Um, yeah, again, I want to make sure I get that out before uh, the program wraps up. Uh, Gus T. Renegade, host of the Cows Talk Radio program, uh, done over 70 programs. Um, Mr. Neely Fuller Jr., Francis Cress Welsing, Tim Wise, uh, Dr. Peggy McIntosh, Noel Ignatiev, quite a few other guests, uh, Mr. Charles Mills, um, Dr. Joy DeGru, um, quite a few folks have come through to share their views at this point. Gus T. Renegade has done all of this uh, with no computer or phone. No computer, no phone has still done uh, the program. Um, has been uh, ranked at Blog Talk Radio as the number one educational program at Blog Talk Radio on more than one occasion with no phone or computer. Uh, the program will be ending on August 5th, 2010, if I do not have a MacBook Pro. Uh, and I need a MacBook Pro with the uh, carrying case as well, the shoulder bag, so that I can protect uh, the equipment. Um, again, if you do not think the program is constructive, don't worry about it. Uh, don't worry about the laptop. Don't worry about uh, supporting the program at all if you don't think it's constructive, and it might not be. 
if you feel that's the case, invest your time and energy in uh, anything that you think would be constructive for non-white people. If you do think it's constructive, I would appreciate the assistance. Um, it would be ideal to get a white person to uh, pitch in and get the resources that I need. If you know any means of securing a MacBook Pro, uh, just put it, to, uh, put it to use and secure the MacBook Pro for Gus if you think this program is constructive. Um, as I said before, I'm pretty certain I could uh, problem solve to get a MacBook Pro if I felt that was the most pressing problem. I do not. I think the most pressing problem is the system of racism, white supremacy, and I would much rather be devoting my time and energy to that problem as opposed to securing a laptop. I think I'm able to use my time and energy better when I can focus on doing programs, uh, working on my blog, and other constructive efforts that are directly about solving the problem of racism, white supremacy. I could be in error. We definitely will see with the counter-racist. Uh, this is a doozy of a counter-racist experiment uh, to see if I will get uh, the equipment that I need to continue the broadcast uh, in eight months. Um, one thing I did want to say uh, before signing off of this program, uh, number one would be please check the blog racism notes blogspot.com. One more time, racism-notes.blogspot.com. Uh, please support uh, Back of the Bus's blog as well. His blog is nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. One more time, nonwhitealliance.wordpress.com. Uh, please support his efforts, uh, Back of the Bus, and uh, I can also plug Cree's blog as well. Cree, counter-racist, evolving engineer. Her blog is Cree, C-R-E-E, seven, dot wordpress, dot com. One more time, that is Cree, C-R-E-E, seven, dot wordpress, dot com. Please support her counter-racist effort. Um, the thing, yeah, that I wanted to, to share before exiting, um, you know, I hear people say, <laughs> what uh, what victims of white supremacy should do is try to uh, convince non excuse me try to convince white people that non-white people are intelligent and worthy of not being mistreated. Um, you heard Mr. Fuller's view uh, today. My view, I do not think that is constructive. Uh, I have seen no evidence that uh, once white people find out that non-white people are smart or intelligent or capable of doing something, that that will prohibit or inhibit them from practicing racism and white supremacy. I've seen no evidence that that is true, uh, and no white person has come on this program and said anything to the contrary. Even Tim Wise, admitted racist, uh, has said that there is no evidence that would suggest that white people are going to discontinue their efforts uh, at practicing racism. So uh, that is my view. I don't think it's constructive um, to invest time and energy in that manner. I could be incorrect. Um, also, I, I definitely think uh, that it, it just non-white people should really think to be in a system of white supremacy. You are dealing with individuals, racists, who can spend billions on making films that depict you as someone who should be feared someone that you should have a total disgust for, and I mean this about black people and non-white people in general, but especially black people, that the system of white supremacy means they can dedicate their entertainment to conditioning the entire world to see black people as Medea and thugs and goons and monsters ball. Really think about that, the implications of everyone on the planet seeing Medea, everyone on the planet seeing Monsters Ball or Precious or The Blind Side. I mean, these are major films. Uh, you know, a lot of these films rung up number one in the country. I believe Blind Side was number one for a while. Avatar now, a lot of people are talking about that. Um, think about the impact of billions of people on the planet being exposed to these images and what that means for individuals who are classified as black. Think about that. Just the impact that that has on your life. Anybody who says 
racism, white supremacy, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Just tell them to think. Don't answer immediately. Just think about the impact that you think billions of people worldwide see Medea, and, and particularly in areas where they don't have a lot of black people. So the only exposure that they have to black people is seeing Medea, seeing the blind side seeing Monster's Ball or Precious. Same uh, director, by the way, make sure I get that in. Same director, Lee Daniels, Monster's Ball, Precious. That's the only image that they have of a black person. Think about how much of an impact that has on your life, particularly worldwide. That's what it means to be in a system of white supremacy, and I hope that really under underscores what Mr. Fuller said about you should expect it to be a struggle, and you should expect it to be depressing as a black person in a system of white supremacy. It's designed to be depressing. You're on a slave ship. It should feel that way, and I think that's probably one of the best responses that I've heard. Uh, I'm on a slave ship. What else am I supposed to be doing? Um Gus T. Renegade, I have taken the same view. This is what I'm supposed to be doing. I do need some assistance to do this. Uh, if I am not able to get that assistance, uh, I'm not going to continue in this capacity. I'll be looking to invest my time and energy otherwise, but I do need some help to continue uh, doing the radio program. If you think it's constructive, MacBook Pro with the carrying case. If not, no biggie. Uh, if I get my MacBook Pro, I will open the chat room back up for the programs. Um, That'll be, yeah, I'll pack that on too. I get my MacBook Pro. I will open the chat room back up, and uh, I have nothing else to say. I'll feel much better about people uh, rambling, saying non-constructive things in the chat room if I am viewing it on my nice new MacBook Pro as I'm doing, hopefully, attempting to do constructive counter-racist programs. Uh, thank you for tuning in. I hope it has been constructive. <clears throat> we'll be back this weekend on Sunday with uh, – Dr. Daniel Kevels uh, yeah, has written, done a lot of research on eugenics. We'll be talking about that again with a white person. Uh, should be very constructive. That will be this Sunday. I believe that is uh, January, see, January 10th, Sunday, January 10th. Dr. Daniel Kevels uh, will be here to talk about uh, eugenics. Uh, thank you for listening to the program, Context of White Supremacy, uh, the goal to replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Love that five-year plan. I thought that was great, too, explaining uh, explaining his intention of uh, replacing white supremacy in five years. Uh, we're trying to do it as soon as possible. If we can do it in, in, in one year, that would be great. You know, Love to do it as, uh, as soon as possible immediately. Um, context of White Supremacy, uh, signing off for the broadcast. Thank you for tuning in. We'll be back this weekend. Gus T. Renegade, replace white supremacy with justice as soon as possible. Thank